Welcome to our latest reading group for On Hannah Arendt. My name is Richard Soltoon, founder of the Richard Soltoon Gallery in London. Today's event is in connection with the gallery's year-long series of exhibitions inspired by Arendt's 1968 publication, Between Past and Future. Our discussion today focuses on Arendt's essay entitled, What is Freedom? What is Freedom is also the source of inspiration behind our gallery's current exhibition, a solo exhibition of the Israeli artist, Braca L. Ettinger, who should be joining us here today. This is our first exhibition with Braca and continues in London until the 24th of July. For those unable to visit, a video walkthrough of the exhibition is also available on our website. We have developed these virtual reading groups to explore Arendt's writings in more depth and have done so in partnership with the Hara Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities at Bard College. Our sessions are modeled off the center's own official virtual reading groups. I will shortly hand over to Roger Berkowitz, founder and director of the Hannah Arendt Center. Our special guest today is Judith Butler, who really needs no introduction. One of the most impactful and thought thoughtful thinkers of today and writer of many books, including Gender Truth, 1990, and Bodies That Matter, 1993. In 2012, she was the winner of the Adorno Prize. Um, Judith's last book was The Force, the Force of Nonviolence, and I think was published in 2020, last year. Judith, it's a great honor to have you here as our special guest. Roger, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Um, it's been a real pleasure uh, uh, working with you and 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 in your team at the, at the Saltoon Gallery. Um, and these reading groups have been a a, a real light uh, a bright spot during this pandemic, even as it's coming to a close. Although I know not in in the UK. Um, uh, we're working this way our way through this really wonderful book between past and and future by Hannah Arendt. That is the um, foundation of this show, this year-long show at the Saltoon Gallery. And, and last month, we talked about the essay, What is Authority, um, with Shai Levy. And, and that essay ends um, with this, you know, optimistic, in a sense, uh, ending, where she says that to live without authority, because she thinks authority, religious authority, traditional authority has disappeared, is to be brought back to the basic problem, the elementary problem of human living together. How do we live together without authority? And, and that is really what the essay, What is Freedom, is about. And I can't think of a better guide to um, uh, lead us in both a reading of the essay and a thinking through of the problem, the elementary problem of human living together than Judith Butler. Um, I had the privilege of studying with Judith at Berkeley back many years ago and uh, always, uh, always enjoy and value what she has to say. So Judy, you take over and she'll, she'll speak for about 15 minutes, at which point there'll be a conversation amongst some of the artists who are involved in the show here. And then we'll open it up to questions on the Q&A uh, on the chat function for those of you in the webinar. Judith, you're up. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and uh, especially pleased to be um, in, a, in a forum where um, people concerned with the arts, um, active artists, uh, and philosophy are speaking together. Um, I think we'll see um, at least halfway through my brief presentation um, how philosophy and the arts comes together. Um, Hannah Arendt begins her essay by acknowledging the difficulty of answering the question that she herself has posed, what is freedom? But she does ask the question precisely because the answer is neither nor known nor easily knowable. Um, she tells us that too often freedom is treated as axiomatic. We assert it and then we build our political philosophies on that foundation. So putting that into question, the axiomatic character of freedom, unsettles the foundation and it shifts our attention from political doctrines that proceed in that way to a form of philosophical criticism or critique, which 
at least at first, is clearly Kantian. What makes it Kantian at first is the distinction she draws between causality, which attributes effects to causes, and freedom, which, she will argue, can be captured neither through an account of internal causality, what she calls motives, nor external causality, the preoccupation of the natural sciences and indeed some of the social sciences. Indeed, both kinds of causal explanations of freedom are, in her words, an assault on freedom. Um, for even if we could enumerate all the reasons for acting as we do through recourse to what motivates us, psychological determinism, or what affects us from the external world, we would not be able to account for that dimension of our action that is rightly called free. On page 151 of a text I believe we share, she remarks that action to be free must be free from motive on the one side, um, from its intended goal as intended effect on the other. And as she will make clear, freedom cannot be determined and still be free. Freedom characterizes something that is not fully determined. Now, of course, one issue that's raised here right away is what does she mean by motives? And um, is there a way of thinking about motives that is non-deterministic? Is it right that we can't take into account motives when we give an account of freedom? And I'll return to this in a little bit. When I talk about what is rightly called freedom, I'm trying to speak in an Arendtian voice. I'm trying to occupy her position sympathetically. I think you'll see where I diverge in time. If we thought that by looking inward, we would be able to account for freedom, we are apparently badly mistaken. We're also lured by a subjectivist understanding of freedom that Arendt opposes. She finds it lamentable. We cannot, she tells us, decipher the obscurity of freedom by looking inwards because freedom does not appear in the realm of thought and it's not purely subjective. So if we start with introspection as the epistemic approach to freedom, we will be forever detoured. When freedom appears, it appears, she tells us, in the realm of politics and specifically in the realm of action. We know from the human condition that Arendt defines the political sphere as action. But here she foregrounds the insight that all action presupposes freedom. Indeed, it would be hard to find any political issue that does not in some way presuppose freedom. That is her view. Freedom then is worldly. It belongs to the sphere of appearance of what appears, what appears commonly to all of us, not an inner reality, not a subjective disposition. It appears and operates only in what she calls an interrelationship with the world. We first become aware, she writes, of freedom or its opposite, unfreedom, in our intercourse with others, not in the intercourse with ourselves. So left to my own looking inward, trying to find my freedom, I will never find it because freedom only appears in a common world and with and through my intercourse exchange with others. It's social, it's public. I would say social, not her sense of social. We have to remember she has a sense of social that is um, distinctive. One of her worries in this text is that the idea of an inner freedom, which for her is non-political, has pre predisposed philosophical thinking about freedom in some seriously mistaken way. So she's clear about what freedom is not. It's not an attribute of thought or a quality of will. So when she first starts to tell us about what it is, what freedom is, she refers to the free man's status, which is uh, a quite, um, uh, which is a term that reverberates clearly with the emancipation from constraint, from slavery, from bondage. Um, it is understood first as the freedom to move and the freedom to gather. Um, when a man becomes free, moves from unfreedom to freedom, and it is a man, and let's hold on to that 
blur between the masculinist and the generic. Let's let's it's a, it's a significant blurring, and I, I want to hold it as such. When a man first becomes free, it, that he is then enabled to move, to get away from home, to go out into the world and meet other people in deed and word. So freedom, as she's laying it out, first becomes clear in the context in which constraints are thrown off when the ability to act in public first becomes possible. Now, she doesn't tell us here what those constraints might be. It could be the family, the private sphere, which is depoliticized, the prison, slavery. The first instance she identifies of freedom is that of liberation from constraint. And yet, even if that's the way she starts the story, or even a general paradigm for freedom, it does not suffice to understand freedom in Arendt's view. For freedom to be true freedom, there must be a common public sphere or what she calls a space. This is not to say that all forms of common space are free, that's not true, um, um, or even that they condition freedom. It's only to say that where freedom truly exists, it exists in such a space, a space that enables freedom. So just to re recapitulate in introspection and subjectivism keep us from understanding this well, but so too does a distrust of politics in post-totalitarian societies. The less politics, the more freedom, a slogan she cites showing us another version of a mistaken methodological individualism, the reduction of freedom to personal liberty, and accordingly, a freedom from politics understood as regulation or control. It is probably fair to say that Arendt's aim in this essay is to preserve freedom against the claims of both individualism and totalitarianism. Further, the liberal tradition has established politics as coextensive with government and expects government to secure the conditions of living. But living for Arendt is not the same as freedom. And yet often freedom is conceived as the freedom to live. For her, freedom will be bound up not with life, not with the freedom to live, but rather with action. Freedom is, it takes its form, its true form, its full form as action. Now, this is an important point um, that she returns to in a few pages. She's distrustful of the freedom to live as a, as a slogan, as an aim, as a norm. Um, and she writes, where life is at stake, all action is by definition under the sway of necessity. Everything pertaining to the care of life's necessities belongs to the sphere of social and economic life but not the political realm. So this remark on page 155 of our shared text um, suggests that uh, needs, basic needs, uh, everything that it has been traditionally associated with the private sphere, at least in the Greek sense, um, uh, is ruled by necessity. Um, I'm not sure that's true. Um, does a wife have the freedom to refuse her husband if he wishes to impose his sexuality on her? Well, the answer is yes. But that kind of freedom is a political freedom that also belongs to the private sphere. If a family doesn't have food, if there's a failure of distribution of um, food and health care and shelter, do we say that's a purely private issue or do we say that that is political? At least for Arendt working within her framework here, the sphere of the private, where life is at stake, is under the sway of necessity. And yet we know that the biopolitical organization of life is a properly part of politics. Her point is that action cannot be determined by motives or external effects. We learned that right away. That was the first paragraph. And that action can only take place in a common public space. Not all spaces, but some of them, yes. She considers the view that freedom may be a principle, one that exists outside the human and is instantiated through human action. But she rejects this view because she claims that whatever principle freedom might be, whatever 
principle is the principle of freedom is one that only becomes known and only actually comes into being through what she calls a free action. And this is an important point and it links to what she has to say about performance, the perf performing arts and the Machiavellian uh, concept of virtu. Um, this is an important formulation on her part. She writes, the inspiring principle of a free act, a free action, becomes fully manifest only in the performing act itself. So there's no principle we have access to outside of the performance of the principle. The performance of the, of the principle is its manifestation. That principle cannot be known in advance. Um, and this principle, whatever it is, this principle of freedom that informs a truly free action it's not realized and then relinquished. No, this principle is inexhaustible. It takes place every time there is a free action. It is never exhausted. Um, and it is open to an infinite iteration. So this is a slightly mind blowing idea on her part. <laughs> One that has kind of claimed me and confused me for some time. Um, such a principle of freedom becomes manifest and known through action, but only through action. So cannot be examined apart from its enactment through action. We come to know it through its, enact its enactment. She writes, the appearance of freedom, like the manifestation of principles, coincides with the performing act. So she concludes that to be free and to act are the same, and this is what I would call a version of performativity in Arendt's theory of action. But I'll return to this in a moment. I'm sorry I can't give a full exposition of this essay, and I'm slightly terrified that the assignment I received is going to result in a full essay at some point. Um, and I'm eager to hear what others have to say, but I do want to focus briefly on this idea of the performing act because it does bring together philosophy and the arts in a very uh, particular way. Arendt claims that it that what she's talking about, this principle of freedom that's only known through its enactment, might be best illustrated by Virtu drawing on Machiavelli. Needless to say, this turn is very controversial, especially um, within the context of feminist uh, political theory. Vir virtu is a masculine virtue, um, and it is linked with or even enacted. Uh, through the ravishing of fortuna, uh, the term for luck, but it's also uh, a way of encapsulating a feminine principle of receptivity. That ravishing that virtu performs, what Stephanie Jed calls rape, treats fortuna as matter and virtu as the form giving power. This Form giving is based on a violent act of domination where consent is not an issue. So Arendt does not, of course, elaborate on this problematic sexual politics at the heart of the Machiavellian doctrine of virtu, although a wide range of feminist political theorists have done so, like Bonnie Honig, uh, Linda Zerilli, Jed, uh, Stephanie Jed, among others. She does, however, embrace this masculinism, worrying later that the reduction of freedom to willpower or associated notions is an emasculation of the concept. She claims that perhaps we can understand virtu not through rape, she's moving in another direction, but through virtuosity. And um, so one question is whether her idea of the virtuosity that we know from some version of the performing arts, it carries with it this same masculinism or is it a departure from it? Um, as she puts it, the accomplishment in a virtuoso performance, virtuosic performance, um, lies in the performance itself and not in the end product, which outlasts the activity that brought it into existence and becomes independent of it. The analogy for political action, she writes, comes from this version of the performing arts. And although she's quick to say that politics is not itself an art, government is not a work of art, that's not true. 
she does make a set of controversial distinctions um, because, especially because they devalue what she calls motives and the creative process. So if we understand the virtuosic performance as exemplifying freedom or as exemplifying the kind of action that in turn exemplifies or enacts freedom, um, we can only do that if we set the creative process aside. She wants to see the process of performance and she wants to see the background of performance effaced, so the infrastructure that makes a performance possible. That would not be part of the virtuosic character of that performance. The creative process which precedes and informs the virtuosic performance would not be evident. Creative process is different from the enactment of uh, the work of art itself. The, um, and so she has separated under the category of motives or even external or objective conditions, infrastructure, creative process, including a psychoanalytic understanding of the unconscious as generating uh, um, artistic material. And she has also um, uh, foregrounded a version of performing arts that does not allow infrastructure or the unconscious into the picture, um, at least the way I understand it. And I raise this issue because I know the gallery is showing some of the important work of Braha Ettinger, uh, my good friend, and perhaps here's a moment where we might contrast Arendt on Virtu and Virtuosity with Braha's work on the matrixial, uh, um, the matrixial uh, uh, subjectivity, which preserves its process in its result and which emerges from a, another reading of the feminine, which is form giving. The matrixial is also form giving. It's a way in which Fortuna might be understood to be form giving rather than simply receiving form as matter from virtu. Um, so that's just um, a, a brief uh, suggestion of what we might think about. I think it's, um, it's of course very controversial to separate creative activity from performance. Um, um, Arendt wants to claim and does claim that uh, only in the performance does the free creative activity appear. So she values the performing artist over what she calls the creative artist. And political action is like performance to the degree that they both require an audience before, before whom virtuosity is displayed. But this display element suggests that politics is not exactly a form of address to that audience or a way of being addressed by that audience. Although in other circumstances, she does um, think about um, politics as uh, an interaction or indeed as a deliberative community. The audience that she invokes here is spectatorial and thus we might say emphatically not Brechtian. Um, no audience members are brought on stage. They're defined or positioned by their capacity to see from a distance and freedom is itself the appearance, um, the action and also to some degree, the spectacle. This is no small thing since for rent appearance is not contrasted with reality. She is no Platonist. Appearance is the very medium through which political reality is formed and given, especially the reality of freedom. But we can still ask, well, what about infrastructure? What about transience? What about life? What about the unconscious? Um, if I had more time, I would take you through some other aspects of this, but I want to just point out one thing that toward the end of this essay, she, she makes a, a quite uh, interesting remark, man is a beginning, um, that to be free is to bring something into being. Um, it is also to act, it is also to rule, and it is to set something in motion. And she draws on both Greek and Latin etymologies to make her case. The idea of birthing or uh, giving birth is an important part of her uh, writing on revolution. Um, um, people come together, they give birth to a nation. And uh, Adriana Cabrero has written, I think, extensively on this uh, maternal uh, 
this maternal dimension of um, Arendt's work. Some people have said that uh, men get to do all the birthing in, in Arendt, um, that the men who are properly part of the polis in classical Greece, who um, were of course uh, only men, property of men, uh, were allowed to be part of that uh, particular community. Um, in any case, there is an idea of birthing, of giving form, of beginning and of acting and even of ruling that gets put together here in the notion that man, or we hope the human is a beginning. Um, for her, the act of freedom has the power to interrupt the automatism that is uh, increasingly part of bureaucratic uh, administrative powers um, and, uh, and here, towards the end, she is suggesting that freedom might also be something like a miracle. She puts it in quotation marks. She's aware that she's bringing a theological concept in, and she sort of means it and sort of doesn't. But let's remember that in her early work, uh, Arendt was also reading Augustine, and that certain Christian ideas, as well as Jewish ones, uh, come to have an important bearing on her idea of what it means to begin uh, to make uh, and to act. So I think I'll stop there. We can open uh, to questions or to other comments. I apologize, I was muted for a second. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, that was uh, an extraordinary reading of a very difficult essay. So uh, I, I, I hope everyone uh, uh, was provoked and and also informed by it. Um, there's two different ways to ask questions. You can use the chat function and you can also raise your hand at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you're in the webinar, you have to use the chat function. Um, maybe I'll just start while people who are in our group of artists that are here are formulating questions and thinking about raising their hands um, and, and ask a little bit about uh, um, this performance uh, verse creative art idea that you were talking about, Judith. Um, you know, I've been in, in another reading group, we've been talking a lot about this when we talk about our end in art. Um, you know, when, when an, an artist puts a work, a painting or a sculpture into the world, there's also a kind of performativity to that. Right. Um, she, and she makes a distinction between the private act of creation and then the public act of, of putting it into the world or the public work of creation and the, uh, the private work of creation and the public act of putting it into the world. Um, and so I'm wondering if that if there's if there's a blurring of this boundary between performance and creativity insofar as a creative artist puts their act into the world, their art into the world. Um, that allows that to become a kind of performative uh, work of art in, in, in your reading of, of RN. Um, yes, but I, I think many performance artists, and you know, there are um, there's some interesting debates within performance studies about whether um, a, a, a work of performance art is, is, is transient, whether it happens and then it's gone. So does it belong to the moment of its enunciation and then it's gone? And uh, a number of people have said, uh, a number of people like that and, and insist that that transient character is, is crucial, but other people have said, no, performance art is different from the theater um, uh, uh, and the stage precisely because it moves into the street or it moves into the museum or it moves into public spaces and it reflects upon the infrastructural conditions of its own emergence. Um, and we see sometimes performance artists as they are getting ready or as they are undoing their performance precisely so that we get a sense of what the life of this cultural worker is or what the conditions are in which uh, performance art is, is taking place. And at least in some versions of performance art, maybe inaugurated um, um, at, the, at the NYU Performance Studies School, um, uh, performance art is happening all the time in ordinary life. It's not 
separable from ordinary life and should not be. It should take place on the bus or it, it, it is already taking place on the bus, which then blurs into more ordinary notions of performativity, how we, how we operate in society uh, through showing ourselves in certain ways. Um, so um, the virtuosic notion of performance art that Arendt has in mind is always stage-based. Uh, there is, um, this is, this is not one that would show, show the living character of the thing or seek to transform infrastructural conditions in a long standing way. It wouldn't be social commentary of that kind engaged in everyday structures of life. Um, it would be more rarefied and I believe it would require um, uh, spectatorial distance in, in order to be appreciated as such. Okay, great. I have one other question I'm going to ask, and then I'll open it up to, to everyone else. Um, you did a really, I think, nuanced and wonderful job talking about the the the, the gender or or, or sexual um, aspects of Vertu and 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 Arendt's idea of freedom. Um, and I and that's clearly there. Um, but there's even maybe a potentially more controversial. Uh, boundary that she uh, elides, which is that between human and animal. Um, you know, uh, in many ways, you know, I, when people say, why do you read Arendt or why is she important? You know, I, I always say there's two answers. One is freedom and the other is meaningfulness. Um, freedom is a way of acting and becoming meaningful because in freedom you act and people see you act and therefore they talk about you, they tell stories about you and you matter. And she says in the human condition, as you know, Judith, you know, that in many ways, the line between those who act in ways that people talk about them and those who don't is a line between human and animal. Um, and to some degree, freedom is for her what separates humans from animals. And some people are more free than others. So I'm just wondering how that how you, how one how one today thinks about that idea in your in your in your thoughts? Well, um, my my own personal view is that um, life is a political issue, <laughs> and uh, it's not just a problem of necessity versus freedom. It's you know the question of how to live and uh, how to survive. If you're migrate, if you're dispossessed, if you're um, un under a condition of war or um, um, uh, or incarcerated or, or enslaved. I mean, there are many ways in which um, uh, the question of how to exercise freedom under those kinds of conditions uh, are, are, are paramount. And I would say the freedom to live is a basic freedom um, that we should be actually uh, affirming, um, uh, not just the freedom to live, but the freedom um, to, to flourish. Uh, and, and I know flourishing might bring us back to action or freedom in the Arendtian sense, but I don't think action or freedom can take place without life. And, and life is itself um, a political issue and has become increasingly so. Uh, I know that she would have, um, she, she resisted the uh, philosophy of life um, tradition. She was, she didn't yet um, um, encounter the notion of the biopolitical, much less the necropolitical, but I think that they are are with us. Um, so I I think that as living creatures, humans are bound to animals, and that is the that is the 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 place of their intersection, their conjuncture, their commonality. And um, for her, at least in the human condition, as you know. She follows Aristotle in thinking about language as being what is distinctive for uh, humans, although we know now that there are all kinds of communication systems among animals and among humans and animals. So, but the Aristotelian notion of language has to do, I think, with the, the big political speech act, the one in which you declare your view or seek to persuade in public and that this is your most human moment because you're engaging and trying to, to make a political world and to, um, and to work in concert with others uh, on the basis of persuasion uh, to create um, 
to create a political um, community. Now, um, you know, for me, the political and the social are not as distinct as they are for 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 Arendt, but um, but I think that the creaturely character of the human cannot really be uh, denied without uh, doing violence to something very fundamental about who we are and what we care about and um, and the entire um, question of caring caring for the earth, caring for other living processes, living beings and living processes on the earth, we wouldn't be able to develop an ecological perspective or indeed a, a politics that cared about um, uh, the, 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 the so-called private uh, conditions of life itself, um, um, maybe, maybe that distinction too would, would have to be recast uh, in light of more contemporary concerns. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, in, in just, and in, in I, as I understand her, it's more about raising the tension or the question between what you call flourishing, which may lead to death because flourishing may lead you to act in ways that cause people to kill you. Um, uh, for her, the act of flourishing is, is often in tension with life. Um, and uh, I don't know if, and so that, that's, the, that's to me the tension that's so, um, that's made so prevalent in her work. Um, I know there's a bunch of questions already. So let me, if that's all right, move on and you can keep these questions and conversations going. Gavin, I know you were, you were hoping to ask a question. Thank you both. Um, Judith, I, I had a question uh, to you, uh, if you wouldn't, or would it be possible to tease out what you mentioned in terms of the matrixio and, and bracha? Um, and specifically, I'm thinking about how the artist might preserve what Arendt understands as freedom um, uh, in, in the process of, of the in the result. Um, well, thank you. I mean, she's here, so always odd to uh, speak about her in front of her. But I've done it before, so here I am. Um, uh, as I understand it, um, from the very beginning, um, uh, Bracha has understood that there are primary impressions that act upon us that we also register and re, uh, uh, re reproduce or re uh, repeat in the in the course of um, artistic making and expression and this is very important because it means that whatever forms we give we are already formed we are subject to formations that are not of our making we receive impressions, those impressions enliven us and dispose us and, and come out in the ways in which we structure, see, paint to the world. So very often something is working through you that is not necessarily of your own making, and yet it's in your own making and it's even distinct, a distinctive feature of what you make. <laughs> um, so, you know, people talk about the haunted character of Bracha's work sometimes, and there is always a question of, what are the layers of temporality at work here? And sometimes there's, um, you know, there's there's a, a a genocidal past that's coming through in a contemporary image uh, by virtue of a set of early childhood impressions that are reworking what has been imposed. Um, that that process of creativity, right, where you are impressed upon by a set of historical traumas or enigmatic events, but you are working them out, carrying that enigma in the work itself. It's not like the active passive distinction would work well. You are affected and you are making, and both are true. They're never overcome. You're not just affected and then you make something as a, you are affected, you continue to be affected as you make, and what you make has all the traces of that for that formative effect they are still vibrant they're still acting in the work itself so that the distinction between activity and passivity or form giving and being the matter which is formed which is at the basis of the machiavellian idea of virtu and the contrast between virtu and fortuna would not be one that could be thought within the matrixial framework that 
uh, bracha offers. I think it's a completely different understanding of making. Similarly, you wouldn't have a result like the painting that it, it can be separated from its creative process. The creative process as it were continues to work on and through in a vibrant and living character in what we call the result. So it's not an end-based, um, it takes you back not only to the formative process of the artist, but what it was that formed the artist and what continues to form that act of forming. It's such a very different framework. Thank you so much. And um, as you were talking, I was even thinking of how Bracha signs that even in terms of the dates of the paintings, you know, that there's the, so you're, you're between past and future with the paintings because they could have been executed over a time period of six years, which seems perverse in contemporary art terms. Um, but thank you, that answer was great. So, Roger. yeah, I, I, I would, I would just also say that the entire domain of receptivity is rethought in Bracha's work and in her philosophical and psychoanalytic writings as well. Bracha, would you like to jump in at all or not? I'll jump quickly. First of all, to say. Thank you, Judith. It's always amazing and and wonderful and a blessing to listen to you. And I think I I I, I accept and I agree uh, with what uh, Judith said. And I will say even more that the this inside versus outside will not work in my method. And the um, even with the natality versus, let's say, mortality, if we bring here even either Heidegger or even Saint Augustine, there is also that there would be that problematic because, uh, because in my painting and thinking, the new is never entirely new, not possible. Once you are transconnected, and you carry traces from the past towards the future and you are vibrating and even the artwork sends you all kind of, I hope, resonance. You continue to vibrate with it. It's not possible to say that the, the new is new. There's all kinds of things that were kind of uh, also rejected when we say that that, uh, that the natality is entirely new. Then we reject the core emergence and even the core passion and some basic for thinking care. So not only I agree with you, but I would say that probably if we want to think uh, to move beyond and carry on and continue thinking freedom, open the question, um, and art today, um, we realize that we already live in a world when there's not only our ideas, but in a world where this outside inside doesn't work like that anymore uh, on many levels and in many mediums. And, and also the performing versus um, the painting would then not uh, exist in the in the way she could uh, put it. Uh, so we move beyond that uh, as well. Uh, I will probably say more as time goes on, because okay. uh, the question of trauma and freedom. I had this thinking. Uh, I remember this musician who was singing in Theresienstadt for three or four years, performing uh, music. And when uh, she was uh, liberated from the camp, uh, she never sang again. So silence could be, you know, and then this passivity, we cannot call it action because we let them betray and we say action is everything, but we might, value more the ambiguity. Passivity activity doesn't work anymore like that. 
And thank you. that's for the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Bracha. Um, Judith, do you want to respond or should we go on? Um, the brief thought I had was, um, and this is why I, 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 I singled out the idea of motives in, in, um, in, in Arendt, because um, if you have a psychoanalytic understanding of wish, desire, even the drives, you're not determined by any of those things. They also uh, are, are uh, characterized by detour, by um, metonymy, by um, derailment, by, um, by, by strange patterns and pathways that, that cannot be pre, um, um, prefigured or anticipated. So there is, there's a contingency there and sometimes motives you know, are, are put in the category of internal causality when if we think psychoanalytically, none of those are causal in, a, in the strict sense that she's using it. They actually contain a lot, a lot that is undetermined and maybe even you know, finally not determinable, not deterministic. So yeah. you know, it, it's worth maybe going back to that category and think what does she exactly have in mind? I see there are some other questions here. Yeah, great. Um, uh, Lindsay, you're next. Uh, maybe you could just quickly introduce yourself and, and then ask then ask your question. Yeah, hi, I'm Lindsay Stonebridge um, from the University of Birmingham, and I was lucky enough to start off this session um, with reading the introduction, the gap between past and future. Judy, that was that was really wonderful, and, I'd and I really would like an exposition from you from the entire essay. Now, um, just as a, a kind of chorus um, um, with Braca, I also think it's quite interesting that in that concept of the new or the beginning, when Arendt talks um, about um, beginning here, she uses the Greek, I think she does it in human condition as well, okay. And so you always have that sense, you will kind of um, um, Derrida in, in the room here too, that there is a sense of the archive is already there at the beginning that may well undo everything, but may well also be a new form of rule and governance because we archive precisely to govern. And so that's that etymology as well. So that was just, just a, 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 a kind of chorus to that point because there might be a way we can wriggle with that sense of a new beginning to bring the matrixel in. Um, with that thought in mind, I just wondered if I could get you, I know you didn't want to do an exposition of the whole essay, which is what I want you to do, <laughs> but um, as you were talking, I wonder if you could um, speculate a bit on um, what your, um, your reading of um, um, action as freedom and performativity might do to the section where Arendt talks about sovereignty in the essay. And I always really love this bit. I think I, where she says, you know, if men wish to be free, it's precisely sovereignty that they must renounce. And I think it's not only living in Brexit Britain over the last five years when she talks about, you know, the, the identification of freedom with sovereignty is the most pernicious and dangerous consequence of this way of thinking. Um, because I mean, what we have in this country is the endless playing out of sovereignty not meaning freedom at all in a kind of comedic um, way. But on the other hand, as much as I love that, I always think this essay was, I think, Roger, correct me if I'm wrong, 1955. So to make a statement such as you just need to you know, renounce sovereignty, I think in some other contexts would sound kind of outrageous. Um, you think, you know, Bandung was 1951, struggles for self-determination and sovereignty were happening at the time which Arendt was famously seeing and not seeing at the same, same time. And it raises, for me, the mind-blowing question of, okay, what politics is there in a sovereignty-driven world? What politics can there be of uh, non-sovereignty, of uh, politi politics of isonomia, of the politics of action and freedom. I just wonder, just wonder if you could speculate how we might take that into those bigger questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, one reason I, I didn't go there is because I was trying to work out the performing arts and the form giving issue. Um, but I, um, I think something is important is, is going on there. Um, she's, she obviously towards the end of the essay makes clear that she's opposed to the identification of freedom with sovereignty. The idea that I'm only free to the extent that I 
am a sovereign ruler over some domain. And, um, and I think behind this, uh, by the way, I believe the essay, and Roger can uh, confirm this, but I believe it was first published in the Chicago Review in 1958. I think that's right. I don't know whether- There's many was. versions of it um, that were published over different times. Um, I'll have to check which one, when this particular one was, I'll take a quick look. Okay. Um, you know, in, in the section of the essay where she um, makes her criticism of sovereignty, it, she actually is relying implicitly on a reading of Nietzsche in the, the genealogy of Morals, the second book where he um, has his famous uh, reflection on promising. And, um, and the, the person who can make a promise to others uh, and keep that promise through time, regardless of the changes that happen in the world, whatever circumstances intervene, that's, that, is a, um, that, that is a certain idea of, of strength. It, it's a, the promise is an action. Um, uh, it is an action that implies others though. So um, it's not a sovereign ruling over, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an entering into covenant or an entering into contract uh, through promise, a promise-making activity, which, which is very different. Um, uh, she talks about the ties and bonds that have to be established um, for the purposes of a, of a future political community or entity. Um, and my sense is that he or she's maybe um, adapting virtue to promise making and also seeking to delink promise making from sovereignty. Nietzsche himself is um, uh, has two views on this matter, and and indeed the second book of the genealogy of morals seems to be a kind of internal battle between those two views. Is the promise making man a, the idea of the sovereign, or is he actually mocking the idea of sovereignty? Um, what she does seem to be clearly and unambiguously affirming is the idea that you can make a promise to another in light of everything that is unknown and unpredictable, right? The promise is not a prediction that I will do this. It's not, there's a good possibility. I promise I will do this no matter what happens, knowing full well that many things may happen that are out of my control. The sovereign has control over everything that happens. The promising person is making this promise in the midst of an unpredictable world um, and also making a bond with another. Now that's important because the bond reintroduces the idea of plurality um, and what it is that I act in relationships with others. So I don't know how the performing artist acts in relation to others. She doesn't elaborate on that. But she told us early on that true freedom is enacted um, through action in a public space and in relationship with others. So what is this interrelationship with others that is part of what she calls the political um, conditions of possibility for freedom as action? Um, that, that might be specified more fully as um, a kind of uh, mutual promise making, that is the stuff of covenants or pluralities. You'll remember in her um, important criticisms of um, the founding of the state of Israel, she, she said, no, not sovereignty, <laughs> uh, cohabitation, plurality, federalism, uh, anything other than sovereignty. Don't, don't do sovereignty. <laughs> that is the rule over others. That's not entering into a covenant together on the condition of equality. So. Um, I think we could pull out some of her work on federalism, promise making, and covenants from from these few few lines uh, in her critique of sovereignty here. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm going to still look for the dates. I mean, it was there was an essay that was published in the Chicago Review in 1960, but that's a different essay, um, and. Uh, this one I think came out first in the Journal of Politics, but I'll take a look for that. But while I'm looking, um, Hetty, you, you have a question. Can you introduce Hi. yourself? 
Hi, I'm Hetty Judah. I'm a, a writer based in London. And I think I kind of managed to cheat my way onto this panel because I was writing to Neve earlier in the week asking um, a scan of your essay introducing Brucker's work. So um, I'm very pleased to be here anyway. I'm afraid I think my question has quite a lot of crossover probably with Lindsay's in that I was um, reading the essay earlier and kind of laughed out loud when it was talking about um, the essential quality of self-control in politics and obviously with our current Greek quoting prime minister this seemed somewhat <laughs> ironic but I but she she does write quite extensively about this question of self-control and um, the Greeks reflecting on the taming of the steeds of the soul um, and I was quite interested by this because I feel like it connects to your ideas about interconnectedness and this kind of you know this this connection both environmental and human in the way that we have this, we, we kind of need to acquire this kind of sense of one another. And I'd love to hear you talking a little bit about how self-control and this kind of reflection on the interconnectedness of, of human and environmental life kind of fits together. Um, well, it's, it's true she has a brief, um, implicit reference to the, the Phaedrus, uh, Plato's Phaedrus in, in this um, essay. And I think that um, there is um, a, a sense as well of a, um, of, of, of action as involving uh, the setting aside or the suppression of, or perhaps the cultivation of any number of passions um, uh, for the for the purposes of of action itself, um, and you know it's uh, it's it's a problem because it it makes it seem as if those other passions that might um, get in the way of action or are not easily tamed or cultivated for the purposes of action. Are um, our necessities or unfreedoms? We are we are unfree in relation to those passions that are irreconcilable with action. And um, I'm I'm not sure that's right. <laughs> it may, you know, it's, what would be interesting would be to think about all the various art forms in which something called action is set aside in order precisely to explore on a canvas or through a text or through photography, a set of uh, emotions in a in a in a somewhat free way. I mean, when we think about the free play of the imagination in Schiller or Kant, we're not talking about a radical freedom. We're actually talking about an ability to sort or sift uh, through any number of um, impressions, passions that occur that can be formed or crafted or investigated or um, or foregrounded. So um, I, I, I worry um, a, a bit that this is a, um, I, I guess I wouldn't call it uh, stoic exactly, but I think that it, 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 it has a martial quality uh, <laughs> uh, of, um, uh, of, of trying to, uh, uh, try to tr trying to bring all, all errant thought and all errant um, um, uh, passion toward action. Now, let's remember there's another part of Arendt which is even more emphatically Kantian and might actually be better for our purposes, which has to do with her turn to aesthetic judgment in her late writings. Because that's actually where she starts to think about, well, how do we, how do we judge? How do we, how do we decide matters, especially matters of moral responsibility and political responsibility when there is no precedent for the kind of situation we are looking at. So the, the, the surprised and disoriented relationship to unprecedented historical realities uh, demands a kind of improvisational thinking or a kind of a, a way of judging that does not, is not based on a prior model. Um, judgment kind of comes into being in relationship to the unprecedented and, and and um, uh, elaborates its standards of judgment in the action of judging. And that's, 
that's extremely interesting. It's a different, I think there's another idea of freedom involved there that might not be so action oriented, but might link the act of judging to the act of making or even of aesthetic free play in, a, in another way. Hedy, do you wanna, are you wanna respond at all or not? Um, no, I know there's lots coming up in the chat, so I'll, I'll okay. uh, make way for. Okay, we'll take one more question here and then I'll move to the chat. Uh, Pauline. Hi, um, my camera's not working, so sorry, I can't put my camera on today. Um, I'm Pauline D'Souza from Diversity Art Forum. Judy, if I'd like that, um, that your last response about this idea about a different kind of freedom, because one thing that kind of worries me is when we talk about um, the inner, and then when we talk about um, action, I mean, my first uh, concern is, is about um, having to deal with acting on impulse, you know, which kind of implies to me then to act on impulse means we need to have some kind of inner sense of ourselves before we interact with other people. And I'm also thinking about the different kinds of art forms that we engage with. I'm thinking about community art, um, and interaction on that level. Um, if we're not able to have an inner sense of self and, and we're not, we're not engaged with motives, then how do we allow these kind of community aspects to develop and create a sense of freedom that moves away from Ardent's kind of very narrow, but also very complicated idea about freedom and the public spaces. And she also indicates without really clarifying what public spaces are not allowed, which don't allow freedom. And I kind of find that very problematic as well because it kind of hinders and takes control and dictates who can have freedom from her perspective and who can't have freedom. Well, I, I guess I would say um, that she doesn't have a typology of spaces like, oh, these spaces are unfree and these spaces are free. Um, to the degree that she holds on to the public-private distinction in the human condition, um, yeah, the private is unfree. Um, but people can move from the private out into the world. The same people can move from the private into the public, and then they become part of a common space. Um, I think a common space happens for Arendt wherever people get together and start to speak and act in ways that she would call free. So it's actually a mobile concept, <laughs> um, an Arendtian polis or an Arendtian uh, space of appearance happens whenever and uh, whenever that kind of thing happens. So for me, um, in thinking about public assemblies, for instance, or community demonstrations or even encampments, I think that we could say that people do come together and they uh, they form, they, they're able to move, they have freedom of movement, they have freedom of expression, they seek to um, uh, imagine and institute a form of life together, self-governing. Um, in some of the, uh, one of the problems in the Oakland um, City Council right now is that they are trying to impose a form of uh, administration on some of the homeless encampments um, uh, in, in Oakland, California. And um, the homeless are saying, you know, we actually have already self-governing self uh, processes and practices and we meet every Monday and Thursday evening. And we have people who are, <laughs> we, we're, we decide sanitation, we decide mobility, we decide advocacy. We, you know, we, we already have the structure in place. Would you like to know what it is? Would you like to work with us? And they were so shocked to think, oh, in that space, there are people gathering thinking, speaking, deciding without any uh, legal or state um, permission to do so, right? Not on the basis of an existing infrastructure. They, they gathered and, and, they and they started deciding and they have a little polis, they have a little political scene. And, and they were saying, you know, maybe you wanna hear how we govern ourselves and what our protocols are, what we've already decided. And it was really very, very shocking. To, to the um, Oakland City Council. And they are now in a position of having to acknowledge that this is a self-governing encampment. And do they, um, if they acknowledge that, then they cease to have absolute uh, rule over it. So this is an Arendtian problem. This is, this is an Arendtian scene. And it's, it's exceedingly interesting. Um, and I'm hoping they win. Sorry, that was a tangent, but I hope it speaks to your 
no it, it, no it certainly does because uh, the idea about self governance without the dominance of the political umbrella is really important because that is another form of power and it restricts and then dictates what kind of power should happen in that notion of self governance which also makes you think but you know we're, we're talking about the global world but we're also talking about indigenous cultures as well there's sets of self power there which moves yes. away from the dominant umbrella true enough true thanks enough. thanks pauline uh vivian Um, yeah, um, Judith, I, I have a few questions. I, I, I've been enjoying listening to you and, and, and being able to follow, I think, what you're saying, but yet I still have very perhaps basic questions uh, about the text itself. So I just want to ask you a, a few questions. I, I'll just try and sort of get the questions out and then maybe you might uh, consider one or two of them. I, I, I want to know if um, in the text, in, in, inside the text or, or inside of what aren't means, is, is freedom something aspirational? Is, is the condition of freedom um, unmediated? Um, is, is it as permanently elusive as as it, as it feels to me, like like uh, the idea or the construct or the fact of an idea about the, the present moment, and 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 th those uh, alongside those is um, is the uh, construct with I think it is a construct with an idea of virtuosity for example what is the relationship of um, an idea of virtuosity uh, to the Machiavellian uh, virtu and 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 I think that there is because in a way uh, if one concentrates on uh, freedom in performance one can sort of chuck out perhaps the idea of virtuosity so those are some of my questions. I, I honestly don't know if they make sense to someone as structured as you might be. Um, well, I found your questions very clear and they do make sense. And, and my guess is that many people share your questions. So you are not alone in, in having those questions. I, I probably had to read this um, uh, text um, several times in my life before I was able to follow it, um, uh, much less to teach it. Uh, and there are still transitions in this text that are not clear to me. It's like, why did she suddenly go to Virtu uh, after she was talking about the performing arts? And then um, uh, is it really clear that action is like what happens in the performing arts? And then, you know, why Machiavelli of all people? Because weirdly, Virtu is, um, is the power to, um, to influence, to learn, to insinuate, but also to, to throw down those who oppose you, right? So there is a kind of domination, ethos of domination, and even an ethos of, of ravishing or indeed rape, which um, is, is famously uh, articulated in relationship to Fortuna. So, you know, it, it, it seems to me there are unconscious elements in this text <laughs> that we might, we might track if we were reading it through another lens, like an interesting transition, but was that logical? Maybe not logical, but you see, she's also beginning again. And um, this idea of beginning again, uh, you know, she starts the essay with this question, she goes a certain way with it. And then she begins again, like, okay, let's start from here. Let's start from another place and let's mm -hmm. end on the idea of beginning. So mm -hmm. she's circling around this idea of beginning. How do I begin is the beginning of the essay. Man is a beginning, is the end of the essay. She's, you know, it's, it's a number of forays, I would say, experimental trajectories into the problem. They're not always linked through a strictly argumentative um, structure. Uh, although, um, the formulations are philosophical, they're political theoretical. She had a question about whether she was a philosopher, but I call her a philosopher and I think we all should. She can be a political theorist too. It doesn't, for me, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, but 
Um, maybe um, at least in answer to part of what you're saying is that I, I don't, you know, usually like she starts as if we're in a platonic dialogue, right? If we're, you know, if we're in the Republic, you know, the question is, what is justice? Oh, Thrasymachus, tell us, what do you think justice is? Justice is the following. No, it can't be that. So then you go through a set of refutations in order to get to justice as a form, which is ideal and which exists above and beyond any one of its instances. And yet all of its instances participate in something called justice. She's not a Platonist, but she's acting like one at the very beginning. Oh, what is freedom? What a hard question. So many reasons why it's hard. Look what's been done to this notion historically. She doesn't take the Platonic view that it's aspirational in the sense that it has an ideal form that we can never reach. We're always failing to reach freedom. What she's actually saying, which is uh, mind boggling, but also interesting to me as somebody who thinks about performativity is that we know freedom only in the act of freedom, in the in action that is free. It, that's where it becomes manifest, knowable. It enters into public world of appearance. It's not something that happens to me privately and separately from a common world. It happens in relationships to others in a common space and it, it is there in the act itself. Can I take it out of the act and then and analyze it separately as a concept? And she's saying, no, this so-called concept is manifest only in the action itself. But can I recognize the action? Can I read, understand, recognize the action? And is that also time bound the way sometimes an act may not be free then, but then later we see it was or, or something along those lines? Yes. There. These are really good questions. Um, this is why I find it so very difficult to understand what she's saying. It has to do with language in the broadest sense. Yes. Um, takes many people a long time to get used to her language, the language by which she's describing these acts of speech and these free actions. Um, but I think what she is um, suggesting is that what is a free action? It gives form, it makes something, it brings it into being, it she even at, in other instances uses the metaphor of birth. Uh, it, it has this, this performative power to make something out of nothing or to make something where we thought everything was already made uh, or to interrupt a process that looks like it's highly determined and there's no possibility for us to intervene. Um, yeah, that's the opposite of freedom, whatever state that is. Yeah. Yes. So, and, and it has an unconditioned character and it has an unpredictable character and it's linked with, with making, giving form, bringing something into being, creating, making something new or making something unnew, making the world unnew. Uh, at the same time, it's, it is linked to politics and the way we live together. So she has several criteria that she brings to bear. It's not, it's not just subjective um, uh, um, it's, it, and, and arbitrary. Uh, th th there must be this bringing into being. There must be this, um, this common world, this interaction. Um, uh, and it must appear in some way. You know, the sphere of appearance is uh, very interesting and it's, a, it's an opening for all of aesthetics. Like, can it appear as painting? Can it appear as a photo? And people like Susanna Gottlieb and others have really thought a lot about aesthetics and, um, and a rent and how to take a rentian formulations like these that are so intensely dense and encapsulated and make them live in, uh, in artistic media that she herself yes. They, they, they are so unesthetic in that sense. So really, they, you know, I mean, I know that is a very inadequate way of putting it, but let's just say it's not her language. And so 
there is, it's a different terrain, a different universe on some level. Um, yes, I think maybe the one way to contextualize it is to think of her as um, trying to build a political, um, a, a political vision out of a Kantian aesthetics. Um, mm -hmm. And if you can enter Kant, then you're maybe two steps closer to um, to entering her her relationship to aesthetics. There is a massive translation to be done, though. There's a massive yeah. active translation to be done, and that's I think part of what you're up against. Can, can, can I just uh, can I just uh, maybe in one? Let me just. There's a question from the chat that I think relate yes. is just which is who determines what is meaningful or what is free, right? And and I think this comes back to what Judy, Judith, you were talking about with principle versus. It's not a universal principle. There's no like rule for determining who is free. It's not, con you know, it's, it's, it's in the act itself. It's in the doing and it's in the thing called virtuosity. Um, can you say anything about that more or to help that person help the question from the chat? Um, I mean, in some ways, what a free act, as I understand it, you tell me if this makes sense to you, Judy, is, is an act that people talk about, it makes an impact in some way. Um, because if, you know, if, if, if I go and say something and no one responds to me, okay, I, I mean, I did it, but there wasn't enough virtuosity for people to take it seriously. Whereas if you go and write something, people respond to it, there's a certain virtuosity. And um, it virtuosity strikes me- Virtuosity is something quite different, quite different. You don't even have to use virtuosity. I mean, I, I did ask about the relationship in terms of what she means by, but you don't even, if you're just speaking about uh, a performative act or an act of freedom or whatever, not just performative in an art sense, but an, an act doesn't have to do with virtuosity in itself. It may collide, but it doesn't they are not interchangeable. I'm sorry, I just thought you used it inter interchangeably and I- With I, what? I think with uh, an act, with an action, with a performance. Okay, it's not interchangeable, it's that there are certain actions or performances which are seen by people as having virtuosity. And they are the ones that are then talked about and become part of what she calls the political story or the story of Pollock or storybook of human history. No, quite so. I just meant in consideration of uh, what it, what freedom means, that's all. So um, I, I think this is a, a, a real problem. She gives us kind of broad criteria. She doesn't exactly show us how judgments of virtuosity would be made. She may be assuming that we already know uh, she might be making uh, uh, an assumption about um, her reading audience. But one thing that I think is extremely important is that she claims that um, freedom uh, appears only in the free act. And when it does appear, it is uh, inexhaustible and infinite. So it, it's not punctual and finite. We can't just say, oh yeah, I just committed a free act or I, you know, that act of mine was pretty free and it's my act, my act alone. Not quite. There's something about the virtuosity that takes it out of the domain of my own, even though I may have done it. It, it becomes identifiable as that infinite and inexhaustible principle that we only identify in certain kinds of action, certain kinds of virtuosic performances um, that belongs to that person or is enabled, uh, uh, embodied and acted by that person, but that is beyond that person, not in a platonic ideal of forms, but as a principle that will and will appear again, has appeared before. So she's imagining that we would be able to see that infinite and inexhaustible principle in any array of um, performances um, and that that would allow us to, um, 
to understand them as virtuosic and also as free. Yeah. Um, and I think she's working with a certain idea of, well, she calls it performance artists. I don't know who she has in mind, but my guess I, is that she, she's thinking that, about opera singers or she's thinking- A concert like, performance. A concert she's, performer, a soloist. A mind, would seem. So, like a fabulous soloist. And you're in the presence of this person and you're very paid for your ticket and, you're, and there's a big, you know, chasm between the stage and you, and you're looking on from that spectatorial position, and you see something operating through that person that they have been able to channel and cultivate, but it is also something that you see and recognize every time the virtuosic happens, and it's, it's not depleted by that performance, it doesn't belong to that performance, because it's infinite, and it's inexhaustible by, the performance is finite, but the freedom that is enacted by the performance is infinite. Therefore, different every time, therefore. Yes, and but yet presumably recognizable every time. Yes, like if I may just end myself by uh, uh, words that uh, from Jean Renoir, the, the most, one of the most amazing filmmakers who ever made a film. Uh, he said, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I carry my ideas for years. I'm no good at telling a new story. I am fascinated by the influence, the importance of caste in the world. He goes on, I won't go on. I think, I think, uh, uh, this, I think when he says the importance of caste in the world, I think he, I, th I, I take him to mean uh, where, where something is coming from or where someone is coming from. Um, we have about five minutes left. I saw Bracha, you were, you were hoping to say something. Uh, do you want to uh, have a final comment or question for Judy? Yeah. Um, it's interesting how the conversation evolves because I wanted to mention Heda Garb, this opera singer, precisely, who after the camp uh, not only did not perform and did not perform on stage, she was an opera singer, but she refused to talk about music. And she refused to talk about music because well, because we, we would never know. But, uh, but one of the, the problematics that this uh, propose is the problematic of uh, the joy, the enjoyment of the music that everybody could listen and enjoy, whether you've been going to die in a minute or just uh, disappear in a minute, or whether you were the director of the camp or something. So she couldn't deal with that. And I'm not sure if we stay with Arendt, we can deal with that or move on. Maybe the late uh, Arendt that you mentioned. And so my question to you, <laughs> Judith, is to get into something uh, in the chapter and say something about it. Um, when she talk about miracle. And I'll, I'll tell you also why I'm thinking that, because in terms, um, the way I think and I see also painting the behavior of painting, what they do in the world. First of all, when you work, you know that it's not only, you not only communicate, I mean, that art working, at least for me for, and for probably many artists, um, is the axiomatic situation, not politics. And so when we say, okay, the art, if it, if, comes out of politics, then it's one form of politics. But if it is axiomatic, like for Levinas, uh, face of the other is, is, is axiomatic. You cannot say it is because of, you know, and then, and so here the art working is, is the questioning for me between aesthetics and ethics and is not just aesthetics. So that's where I'm trying to, to get. There are many things that could be purely aesthetics. And even a lot of acts that are creative. And they are creative. 
but this is one way for me to, to differentiate whether they are outworking or not, because we are very creative and with every new beginning, we are creative. And I'm coming to the question of the miracle. I'm just fixing on what, why it is interesting to me, because I see the relation at that particular moment, how she's thinking Saint Augustine, Saint Augustine, I don't know how to say that, his name in English. And for Saint Augustine, grace is only an interruption from above. No matter what we will do, we will think motivation, not motivation. We cannot bring, uh, the grace will arrive or not arrive and, he, and hit uh, wherever it wishes. A bit like the miracle, in, I, I would think. But it remains in the domain in a certain uh, transcendent domain. And, and when, when, uh, when I think this, I return to Gavin and, and the question of art and the matrix and all of that, that uh, to think grace in terms of the human and the, in terms of art and in terms of care, uh, maybe we could deconstruct a bit this miracle moment uh, that I, I'd, I'd like to hear you about the miracle in that chapter. Mm. Oh, well, thank you, Bracha. I mean, I, it's interesting because I, I am about to return to her early work on Augustine for a completely different reason. And um, a number of people I know are reading it for some reason. I'm wondering if it's a timely text is like what's happening in our, you know, late phase pandemic world, um, hopefully late phase. Um, I, um, look, I think there's a, there's a theological dimension to this text that comes through in the infinite and inexhaustible character of freedom that is nevertheless embodied in this yeah. and that uh, performance, but also in this idea of the miracle that is man um, um, and the miracle is of course in quotation marks. I, you know, when I read Arenta, I think, oh, I wonder what she wrote in German. And I, and I realize, no, no, she's writing in English. She's just writing as a German speaker in English. <laughs> so there is no, I can't go back to the German. It's unfortunate. I can imagine it though. Um, but I, uh, I think this idea of the new beginning, the world that can start anew, um, the idea of politics as the, the practice of starting the world anew uh, is a post-war vision. It's also a theological vision um, uh, in her work on revolution, the people who come together is a long disquisition on beginning, on beginnings in in her work on um, revolution but if you go to saint augustine yes then we will mention also lyotard maybe one of the reasons you know one who was the one he was working on it before before he died i think he did not finish that book but it, the book exists so if you go to saint augustine he's um finally uh, goes to the present and the new thing is that as um, okay we get away with the past then we get away with the future and we enter the present he has his reasons but we also get away with the we accept the prime the scene men are all sinner okay so they are ev evil by definition. And if grace enters, it's total miracle and it's on only by chance and we have no control of it. And I think that uh, in, in, in art, we can think and probably also today because I'm suddenly thinking what a, a donor would say about that. Can we or can we not do something new? That's for you, Judith. You'll think. No, well, thank you. I mean, I. I actually wonder whether um, for Arendt it's love rather than 
grace that becomes the most important concept from Augustine and and why um, why that becomes important. It's a and and I also have a a question of whether there's a a a, Ju, a Judaic and cr Christian encounter in her reading of that particular text. Maybe mm -hmm. the one thing I can say um, is that it is somewhat remarkable that in the 1950s, which is also the time of the economic miracle in Germany, um, that she is using the miracle idea of man, man coming into being man as a beginning, man as um, distinguished by the capacity to create anew during mm -hmm. that period of time. And she's writing against the Adorno who would say, no poetry after Auschwitz. Um, uh, yeah, she's but writing... there is a jump there. There is a jump uh, in the thinking. Uh, yes, but the jump is what she likes, right? Between past and present, there's a leap. There's a leap. And when she describes that Kafka scene, you know, where the referee is her sort of trying to work out, you know, how to handle past and present, there's this strange, impossible thought in the middle, which is the present. And she's accepting that it's 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 a break with the linearity of history. It's a beginning again. And so there's there's a, a strange, uh, emphatic, theologically in, infused optimism with her idea of beginning again, even making the capacity to begin or, or beginning as the defining feature of man. Um, and she's she's moving against her pal Benjamin, right? Who had who would be closer to Brecht or the notion of the gesture or the fragment or the ruin. Um, mm. she's, she's certainly pushing against Adorno and the, um, the, the suspicion of so much um, uh, lyric poetry, although she's with Adorno, I think in the class politics. I think she likes the virtuosic concert pianist. She wants to be in the Berlin, you know, auditorium <laughs> you know yeah. she's you know so there is something there although i don't think she would like adorno's music i think that would be completely out of the question i'm sorry i can't go further but no know. i see your point but i also think that it is it were it is worth it to say that that uh, for me and for different artists surely not even now 20th century, beginning of 20th century, before. There is the question of the, the spirit and the soul and the cosmos and what bring us together and how can we uh, talk about, find a language. Um, and then it is more easy for me when I'm reading to see where the author doesn't know what to do and starts with infinity and concept that will remain before and after and last without, you know, but the, the question of the spirit, which artists are not so ashamed to address in a, in a non-religious way is perhaps important if we are in the context of gallery and artwork and of all kinds, huh? all kinds. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay put in the chat uh, a, a reference to grace that Arendt makes, uh, I believe at the end of section nine, chapter nine of the origins of totalitarianism, where she cites Augustine, Folo would cease, I, wet, I, I want that you be, um, I want you to be, um, which would be, I think, probably the closest place I think Arendt does come to a theology. Uh, um, the other, the, the, I think what Bracha and Judith were just discussing in many ways, I wouldn't call necessarily theology, theology although it's a political theology of sorts in Arendt's, it's more transcendence. And, and the word that Arendt really is obsessed with or cares a lot about with is immortality um, and the immortality of the world or what she calls an earthly and worldly immortality. And that's why freedom and politics are so important and virtuosity because they create lasting things that people tell stories about and talk about and, and um, inhabit a, a durable, lasting and earthly immortal world. And I have um, one more word I want to, to, to I can't deny you, Brock, you know that. You cannot, that's no. perfect. 
No, because I know, and I read it in the chapter, that indeed she says that the freedom is related to the fact that other people will listen and other people will understand and you make, and they will react and they, it will make them. Um, but I would uh, say that she limits herself, even in relation to what she wrote a minute before and a minute after. And maybe we should not so much insist on that reaction because when you create uh, something uh, a poem or or painting or even think perform it, it doesn't matter you are not i think most artists don't say okay and if it will be heard and then it will exist usually you you accept that you might ne never be heard or heard in 100 time or heard in 30 years, which is a good case already, 30 years is, is nice. Uh, some women artists, you know, say nobody listened to them for many, many years, or poets, and, but you intend the world, you intend other human beings, you intend to change something. But then the relation to how, how change happens is not necessarily like a political uh, manifestation. It can change, even political manifestation can change for today and re forgotten tomorrow. And so, so I wouldn't limit her to her words on why it is important to interfere in the, in the public sphere. She's much giving more than that, or at least, you know, she could take that sentence away as far as I'm concerned. Okay, well. I'm going to give you that last word, and I want to thank um, Judith Butler for uh, performing and acting with us today and thinking with us today. Um, it's been a real pleasure, Judy, and um, thanks to Richard and the Saltoon Gallery for, for hosting us and for all of you to being here. Uh, thank you all, and we'll see you uh, in about a month uh, to read the next essay, The Crisis in Education. Thanks all very much.